Hey, this is a video for 8.5, eutrophication. So go ahead and check out the overview and set up your guided notes. So remember that troph, T-R-O-P-H, has to do with feeding. Uh, and we have talked about eutrophication throughout this entire year. Um, but this video is particularly about cultural eutrophication, which is anthropogenic eutrophication. So before we start talking about that, we're going to talk about uh, the different types of trophic lakes that you will find. First of all, oligotrophic. Uh, if you notice right here, you got very few, uh, very little like living things, very few biotic organisms in there. Um, an example is Lake Baikal in Russia. It has an incredibly high oxygen content and it has low nutrients and low turbidity. So because there are low nutrients, there cannot be a lot of uh, plants present in there and as a result there's not a whole lot of fish in there either it is incredibly clear water um, you can look up images of Lake Baikal but the water is very clear because it has very low turbidity because there's not a lot of stuff inside there now another one is you have a mesotrophic lake so if you look between oligotrophic and mesotrophic now we're starting to get you know more sediment on the bottom they're starting to make more nutrients can support more plant and fish life you may have more emergent plants and then you have a eutrophic lake and eutrophic lakes are lakes that are filled with nutrients they are there's just a whole lot of life plant and animal life now the process of eutrophication, and this is cultural eutrophication process. So first you may have agriculture, you may have uh, CAFOs like livestock, you may also have human sewage and, and wastewater treatment. But that will release runoff and sewage into a body of water. That will cause an increased turbidity, which can cause a reduced photosynthesis to the benthic plants. Remember benthic is on the bottom. But now this runoff in the sewage will also contribute to eutrophication because it provides nutrients. That eutrophication will lead to an algal bloom. And this algal bloom is a growth of algae that will have a lot of photosynthesis, will release a lot of oxygen into the surface water. However, there will also be oxygen coming in from the atmosphere as well. But when the algae dies, it will decompose. It will decompose at the bottom of the at the bottom in the benthic area. It will have a very high biological oxygen demand, which means the bacteria that are breaking it down are going to consume most of the oxygen that is present in the benthic areas. Now that can lead to a decrease in the fish populations, um, leading to fish death. And the fish death is coming from benthic hypoxia. The fish are asphyxiated. Okay, um, a couple of things. Bacteria are decomposing, but remember that decomposition, the decomposition process is cellular respiration. It is the bacteria and the other decomposers are performing cellular respiration. And that uses up oxygen and uses up glucose. It's using the glucose that's found in the tissues of these dead organisms. Now we have some local hypoxia hotspots. Most notably, closest to us is the Long Island Sound. And the reason that this is a hotspot is because there's very, very poor circulation. There's not a lot of, of, you know, currents, ocean currents hitting there. So this is going to be an area that is very hypoxic. And there's also going to be an accumulation of nutrients and sediments from runoff. Um, from industrial areas, from, you know, urban areas, um, agricultural areas as well. You also have Cape May down in New Jersey, uh, this Cape right here. And a really famous example is the Chesapeake Bay. This is very, very hypoxic as well. So all three of these you may see on a free response question. But the biggest hypoxia hotspot in the United States is the Gulf of Mexico. Because the water is warmer, um, because of climate change, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico is not able to hold as much water. There's also a lot of agricultural sediment coming down through the Mississippi River and leaving a lot of this uh, 
Remember that uh, eutrophication is caused a lot by nitrates and phosphates, and that is found in fertilizers. So anytime you have that entering a waterway, you're going to have uh, potential for cultural eutrophication. Now the cyanobacteria are found in these eutrophic areas, and cyanobacteria can be very toxic. Uh, you'll see that they have a nice green tint to it. They can make the water look really green. Uh, it can be toxic to humans and their pets uh, if they are exposed to it. One way of mitigating this, <clears throat> and remember, this is not fixing, this is not preventing the problem. This is fixing it once it already has been a problem. Um, is we could dredge the bottom of a lake. We could dredge the benthic area. If you notice, we have phosphates and other pollutants, other nutrients that have settled down to the bottom of a waterway. Well, you can take a big boat, basically kind of taking a big rake in a vacuum uh, and just scraping all of this benthic material up and disposing of it probably in a landfill or treating it first before incinerating it. I don't exactly know how we would do that around here, but um, typically you're going to remove it from the water so it's not able to uh, be released and provide nutrients for another algal bloom. Uh, one way of remediating uh, this is the Clean Water Act. And this is providing a remedy or preventing the environmental threat. The Clean Water Act, much like the Clean Air Act, but the Clean Water Act regulated filling of wetlands. Remember that wetlands are excellent at filtering out uh, water, uh, water pollutants. So keeping our wetlands intact are very important to keeping the quality of our water um, <clears throat> the best that we can keep it. Um, maintaining the, uh, the waterways that we have is going to be the best way to prevent uh, the spread of any sort of toxins that are found in any runoff. Uh, we're trying to protect the wetlands because remember wetlands are a excellent place. It's an excellent habitat for wildlife and there are uh, different areas that are trying to restore the wetlands. And like I said in the previous video, it's not always easy to restore a wetland. It's much more expensive. It's much easier to just not drain the wetland in the first place. Now what I would like you to do is respond to this check for understanding. And for our FRQ practice, I want you to describe a method to remediate the impacts of eutrophication. I hope that this video was informative. I thank you for your attention, and I will see you soon.